All right. Are you ready for rapid fire then? Henry says I am. It's time for some rapid fire. All right. What will tell more about the Irish this week, a win or a loss? Uh, I think when you're considering this week, uh, what, what would tell more about Notre Dame? Uh, I think that a loss would tell more about Notre Dame because – it would be falling back into bad habits or bad patterns. Um, and if we truly believe that Marcus Freeman as a head coach is out of this kind of cycle of losing a game here and there that he's not supposed to, um, then I think that a loss would be kind of uh, more indicative of, you know, some, some issues going on because I think right now is that you're favored. You have a better defense. You have a better special teams. You have a better offense. You're supposed to win this game. The only hiccup is that it's on the road against an experienced head coach that has been terrific over the last 10 seasons. So, you know, I, I just think that you have to win this game in order to not fall back into some bad habits that people have criticized Marcus Freeman about. Completely agree. And, it, you know, again, even though the, the the name up there still says Clemson, it is not the same Clemson team. And, and I mean, they have shown that with losses to NC State in Miami the last couple of weeks. And the, the record – is four and four. You know they've lost to Duke. Now, what it, was it a better Duke team than usual? Of course it was, but they've lost to Florida State as well, a, a good Florida State team. But and again, a couple of overtime games. But you're supposed to win this game if you're Notre Dame. Notre Dame, across the balance of the schedule, has been a better team than Clemson has been this year. And for all the things that you just talked about, I completely agree. A loss would say more. Because then you're back to, well, now you're losing games that you're supposed to win. Even if it's on the road and even if it's against a, a quality defense and all that, it is not a quality offense. It is not a quality team across the board. It is a team that Notre Dame should beat. And so a loss would say more about where, you know, things are with, with Marcus Freeman and this program right now if they were to drop this game with everything that Notre Dame still has to play for this season. Yep. So Mitchell Evans is going to miss the rest of the season with a torn ACL. That leaves Holden Stays, Eli Raritan, Connor Flanagan, and of course Sherwood Davis at the position. Scale of 1 to 10, how big a loss is Evans? So, you know, I'm not going to sit up here and act like losing someone like Mitchell Evans is not a big deal. Obviously, when you you lose a guy who is, you know, a staple of uh, at, at the starting position for his position amongst the offense, um, it, it's going to be a, a big deal. And then you kind of throw in his emergence over the last kind of four or five games and Sam Hartman's comfortability throwing him the ball. He's become, you know, the leading wide receiver. Statistically, I think in terms of receiving yards, he was up there. So, yeah, it, it's going to sting a little bit. But the thing I have to fall back on is Notre Dame is is kind of, a, you know, tight end you. They, they, they just crank out tight end after tight end. Um, they have a ton of depth at tight end as well. Um, so again, it's, it's not that it's not a big deal, like losing a, a, a very quality body and obviously someone who won the starting position at the beginning of the season. Yeah. Uh, but you still have a ton of depth and you still have Eli Raritan who is, you know, amongst those tight ends known as kind of the best overall tight end that, you know, the, the combination of, of a catcher and a blocker. And so, you know, getting him back to full health definitely helps in terms of that depth as well. So I would put this at around. I'd say like a six and a half is where I'd end up at, at the end of the day. I put, I put it at around a six. I'm in that same ballpark as well because of the things that you're talking. This is still a, a position group that is in really good shape. When Mitchell Evans was out earlier this year against NC state, Holden stays had his best game of the season with the, you know, there've only been 200 yard games by a, an Irish pass catcher this year. And Mitchell Evans had one of them against Duke Holden stays had one of them against North Carolina state and stays has kind of disappeared. And I think that he has a, really a chance to reemerge. The thing with him is like, he got being screwed the, on that touchdown against Pittsburgh. Uh, that's true too. You know, like, like that, that bad pass interference call, you know, that was actually ironically thrown against Mitchell Evans, but you know, like a little bit of uh, whatever it is, what it is. But my point is, I think that Holden stays fully has the chance to kind of reemerge now. And uh, you know, become you know the next tight end target my my concern even though Mitchell Mitchell Evans has been great it's not like with Michael Mayer 
where the offense ran, you know, ran through Mitchell right. Evans. That's another like, key point. Right. It's it's you know, it's still a pretty you know, wide out spread around the ball kind of kind of offense. Whoever's They're, open is open. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I think that, you know, Mitchell Evans was able to take advantage, you know, even in like even his numbers had dipped a little bit the last few weeks. So I think they'll still be okay. It sucks that Mitchell Evans is going to be out for the rest of the season, but you know, we we've seen before they've got some really good tight ends in that room and I've got full confidence that that Holden stays and and uh you know, Flanagan and Sherwood and and um Raritan can can step up here in the near future. And we'll kind of continue this in just a second with more of these guys, but did you the the, the tweet from Mitchell Evans' dad, Adam, he tweeted this, to all of you putting this on Coach Freeman, and I can't be more clear, STFU. And I guess I didn't even realize this was a thing until I saw uh, Tyler James retweet this, but apparently there were a lot of fans, you know, coming at, like, Marcus Freeman because Evans was injured, Notre Dame's leading 37 or nothing, you know, why is he still in the game? And I mean, it was the third quarter. You're, you're like, what, about two-thirds of the way through the third quarter? By the fourth quarter, Marcus Freeman emptied the entire bench, but Sam Hartman was still out there. You know, all the starters were still on the field. It, you know, it's it's not on Marcus Freeman. It's Anyone could be hurt at any time. You know, it didn't have to be in a blowout situation. Any, It's, it's football. It could have happened – at any time. So I, I completely agree. What did you think? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I think you could word it a little bit better. Um, but the, the general message at the end of the day is you can never predict injuries. You can't predict if it's going to come in, you know. It, so here's how I think about injuries, right? It doesn't matter. It, it's like almost like a, a usage clock on whatever – has gotten hurt, right? And so no matter if that was you played three extra minutes in the fourth quarter or you play those three extra minutes in the first quarter of the next game, that usage time is still being put on your body. It's just a matter of where it falls on the schedule at a given time. And like you said, there's no reason that Mitch Levin should have been taken out yet. Most times, and we see this across the board, um, not just at Notre Dame and, and specifically this season, you know, these teams, when they're blowing teams out, you get your team out of there probably at the start of the fourth quarter, right? And you still have do. you still have an agenda to run as a team. You still have to stay fresh and stay in tune. You need to see certain things out of your starters before it's time to pack it up and say, we're good, we feel confident in where we're at with everyone else. Let's move on to our second strings um, because we feel everyone is prepared, you know, and, and we saw enough for the next game down the road. And so I don't think Marcus Freeman should catch any of the flack um, and again, like I was trying to uh, allude to is, you know, injuries don't pick and choose when they want to pop up. They, they just happen. Right. And so that injury could have happened again, the first quarter next week, the second quarter, the week after that, or maybe the fourth quarter against Stanford, there's no time clock for when those go off. So it's not a matter of, you know, it, it, when it specifically happened, it, it was a matter of just kind of that specific instance, um, and time and place on the field. So. Yeah, it's just a very unfortunate situation, and it, it just sucks that when injuries happen, there's always you know someone to look to blame. Injuries happen because of freak accidents. There's literally usually no one to blame. It's football. It could literally happen on any play, and regardless of what the scores, you know, the score is, and you know, again, it was it was still the third quarter, and I rewatched it today. There was still what something like five six minutes left in the third quarter when it happened and Marcus Freeman, you know, he waited until the fourth quarter rolled around and he got Angeli and he got, you know, a lot of those reserves in there. Now he did keep Estime in and, you know, Estime ended up getting another touchdown and, and getting his yards, but they've done that a couple of different times with Estime. Where I, I think I, that's an Estime preference. I think he wants yeah. to be that guy that closes out the game for his team. I think that's the leadership and responsibility he wants as a player and he's he's made it very vocal to the coaches that right i don't care i will finish games out for us so on the subject of the tight ends do you buy or sell eli raridan becoming the third irish tight end to have a 100 yard receiving game this season 
Um, I sell that, um, and I think if there is another wide receiver to have a 100-yard game, it would be Holden Stays. Um, again, I just think he's solidified himself as kind of the pass catcher of, you know, where we're at in this season uh, and Eli Raritan coming back from those injuries. I think Holden Stays has, again, kind of put himself in as the the pass catcher. But I, I told you this last week. Notre Dame gets into that formation and goal line where they go like two – they use two tight ends as a fullback – quarterbacks under center and then they have the running back behind the two tight ends slash fullbacks one of those tight ends is going to catch a touchdown on that formation eventually <laughs> it's just they need to hit one play action out of it and someone's going to be open i don't disagree i think that's a perfect opportunity for him to to set that up and do it i don't think it's going to be rared in either simply because um he doesn't even have a catch, <laughs> let alone anywhere close to 100 yards. I think he'll start to get more involved in the offense as a pass catcher. He's been a, a good blocker. And like between Stays and Raritan, Raritan is a much better blocker than Stays. That's really the thing that has kept Stays from being a complete tight end is the blocking aspect. Much better receiving tight end. We haven't seen that at all from Raritan so far. And, you know, we saw Cooper Flanagan make his first catch last week on that 19 yard touchdown pass that we talked about. So I don't buy Eli Raritan going for a hundred yards. I think if any of the tight ends are, like you said, I think it would be Holden stays again. I, I think it would be him having his second 100 yard game, which is like, he's still got more 100 yard games this season than any actual wide receiver on the roster. So there you go. Still got that. Even though, you know, like, again, like going back to some of the quarterback stuff that we were talking about at the beginning of the show, the wide receivers as a group had their best game of the season against Pittsburgh last week, which is, you know, again, a little bit odd considering Sam Hartman threw two interceptions and no touchdown passes. Right. But the receivers as a group had their most overall production last week. So maybe that's a good sign of things, you know, to come for Hartman and the rest of the offense. So Marcus Freeman was asked yesterday if his cornerbacks coach, Mike Mickens, is ready to be a defensive coordinator. And here's the answer. I absolutely think Mike Mickens is, is ready to be a defense coordinator. Um, and so we gave him the passing game coordinator title um, during the offseason. And uh, he, is, he is a tremendous football coach, um, schematically and in the fundamentals of playing the cornerback position. You know, one of the greatest things he does is the way he evaluates. You know, I, I've said this story before, but at Cincinnati, I, I wasn't standing on the table for Sauce Gardner when we started recruiting, and, and Mickens did. Mickens said, this is the guy um, that we need here. And we knew right away that um, when he got to campus, man, he was special. And the same thing goes for the, the guys in this room now. He's a great evaluator, um, and then he's a great developer um, of the cornerback position. But as far as the schematics, he has a great, a brilliant mind. And they're, they're all in that defensive room collaborative on, on the game plan. Um, but um, I, I, I firmly believe Mike Lewis is ready to be a defensive coordinator. So two-prong question here. If Al Golden were to leave to become a, you know, either a head coach in college or a defensive coordinator in the NFL, do you promote Mike Mickens? And the other thing is if Golden stays for at least for – another year what do you do with Mickens at that point if this is a guy who you think is ready to be a defensive coordinator yeah so if I'll go and leaves first question um based off of you know everything we just heard from Marcus Freeman combined uh with the growth and development that we've seen out of the cornerback position for Mike Mickens I think all signs uh you know lead to or indicate that he would be ready to be defensive coordinator because like he said like where has Notre Dame excelled the most on their defense this year in the pass game and at the cornerback position and their safeties, that's all led by Mike Mickens. Right. And so I think, and, and again, if you combine that with everything that Marcus Freeman has said about him, you know, knowing he's seen Mike Mickens in meeting rooms, he's seen him in his preparation, et cetera. I don't think that there's anything that says that Mike Mickens couldn't be your defensive coordinator. And this is like the perfect tutelage or apprenticeship, I, you could call it, if that was the scenario too, learning from Marcus Freeman, learning from Al Golden, and now getting his opportunity. And then if Al Golden stays, I think at the very least you want to kind of look at maybe co-defensive coordinator or assistant defensive coordinator. 
keep finding ways to elevate someone like Mike Mickens, or he's going to leave to find that opportunity. And then you just, you kind of, kind of have to keep finding opportunities for him until Al Golden leaves. And if, if that doesn't happen, then, then I think you might see Mike Mickens leave at some point to get his shot at being a defensive coordinator. Yeah, I agree. You know what? My, my only hesitation like if Golden were to leave in promoting him is just the fact that you've got so much relative inexperience at you, would, you know, between the head. Coach. I think that's where you would hope that Marcus Freeman would step in a little bit because they've been together so long. Right. Been together. Freeman has the defense in his background, obviously, and that kind of thing. But that, you know, again, that, that, I mean, the guy has shown both in recruiting and development and just football acumen that he's ready. And you hear Marcus Freeman talk about him and he says, that he's ready. But that was my only hesitation. But I think the more that you look at, like, especially how this secondary continues to, you know, improve and how big a part that is in this defense, I, I think that you, you know, that even like, and you look back at what he's talking about with Sam, Sauce Gardner and his ability to, you know, to, to see the talent in him and then bring him in and, the, and Sauce ends up being the number four overall draft pick last year. So, and, and Mike Mickens, was a big part of that, both his development and his recruitment. And you look at Benjamin Morrison now, and you look at what guys like Christian Gray and Jaden Mickey are, are starting to turn into. So I think that, that yeah, he is a guy that has to have some priority. And if Al Golden – so if Golden were to leave, I, I think I think that I would be like 9 out of 10 probably ready to make him defensive coordinator. Uh, again, like the one would be just the fact that there is some inexperience. But the other side of that is – you know, they made him the passing game coordinator this offseason, which came with, you know, probably, you know, at least some kind of raise. But at the same time, making him probably, you know, you're, you're exactly right. You have to continue to give him some kind of extra title and some kind of extra responsibility. Otherwise, you're going to lose a really good coach to somebody else and he's going to go somewhere and have a lot of success. And I mean, this guy's only 36 years old. He's still really young right now. So, you know, whether it's making him assistant defensive coordinator, giving him another pay raise, whatever it happens to be, you need to find a way to keep Mike Mickens on this staff until, you know, potentially he does end up becoming the coordinator at some point. Okay. So now we're going to get into a couple of things that some coaches said we didn't get a chance yesterday because we were off to talk about the Pat Narduzzi comments after uh, the beatdown that his team took at the hands of Notre Dame. He says, here's the quote from Pat Narduzzi after the game quote, I'll go back as a football coach. You lose a lot of good players from a year ago and you think you're going to replace them. And obviously we haven't again, it starts with me. I didn't do a good enough job coaching today. Put it on me. We've got to make plays, end quote. And, of course, his players are out there retweeting it, didn't care for what he saw <laughs> for what they saw uh, from their coach. So what do you think about these Narduzzi comments? Um, I think you can leave out the part about we lost a lot of guys. Basically what he was implying there is we lost a lot of guys last year. We brought in a lot of guys who we thought could replace them. And simply they haven't been talented enough or good enough players to live up to the expectation. I think you got to leave that part out. It, you could have just simply just said, this loss is on me. I didn't do enough. You know, we'll go back to the drawing board. But I think the biggest thing with Pat Narduzzi, and this is his overarching issue and the common denominator, is he just doesn't know when to just shut up at times and bite <laughs> his tongue. And, and this was one of them. And, the, and it, it continuously comes back to bite him at the end of the day because of what I – no player – and it was funny because players were literally retweeting it probably while they were sitting on the bus, yeah. you know, scrolling through all different – waiting for their court, their coach to come out of the post-game uh, conference so they can get the heck out of town, right? And so, again, it's just a bad look when you say we lost because essentially our players weren't good enough um, as good as our players as last year, but it's like you look at last year and they still weren't very good. And so, again, I just – Pat Narduzzi needs to figure out how to uh, say things in a much more efficient manner and not, you know, you know, blow up his own game essentially. And it's it's been, what, four days since then, and he's still trying to figure out how to do damage control on this because he was addressing it, I think, yesterday in his press conference. And, 
you just you you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube on this kind of stuff. It's out there. And no matter what you follow that up with, you can't say you lose a lot of good players from a year ago. You think you're going to replace them. And obviously we haven't. You're saying that your players aren't good enough in public. And this is why already people have become frustrated with some of the things that Marcus Freeman says, because they don't think that he's going far enough, you know, with some of the stuff that he says, but he's not throwing anybody under the bus and, and, and Pat Narduzzi completely threw everyone on hit, you know, everyone that plays for him under the bus by saying this, and it doesn't matter what comes after it, you know, cause he, cause that's what all he's tried to do since then is say, I didn't do a d- good enough job coaching. Well, that's not what you said first. The first words out of your mouth is your players aren't good enough. And you just can't go back on that. It's, you just can't do damage control. Yeah, and that. as much as we knock Marcus Truman for just saying we didn't execute or, you know, kind of his general yeah. blanket statements, He's I would find that better that. than throwing guys under the bus. And that's the thing is Marcus Truman will never, never throw his players under the bus. He'll say us as coaches just didn't present the information in a way that our players could execute it in a manner, right? Like it is never, ever the, the you know, this player didn't do this or that or et cetera. And I think that is a very – um, admirable trait on behalf of Marcus Freeman. Even if at times we as the media are trying to draw it more out of him, he still stays, you know, strong in that it's, you know, execution and, and we as coaches didn't do enough. Yeah. Sloppy Joe says, small group of Notre Dame fans love drama. Marcus Freeman won't give it to them, so they dislike him <laughs> for it. <laughs> How about Dabo? Again, Dabo giving us some good content the week Notre Dame is getting ready to play him. You know, you if you haven't seen this whole exchange. Um, so Dabo is doing his coach's show, and they take call-ins on the coach's show. Like, like shocker, you know, like down in the South, apparently they still do this, <laughs> where, <laughs> where Nick Saban's taking calls and Dabo's taking calls. And so this guy, Tyler, calls in and asks him why he's being paid over 11 million bucks to go four and four. And so Dabo shoots back and it was a pretty long exchange. The whole thing from the time Tyler starts talking until the clip that was put up, you know, yesterday. Anyway, it's like six and a half minutes worth between that and Dabo's response. So I've got kind of the uh, the part where. It, uh, it it starts with the tail end of what this Tyler guy is saying, and then about the first minute or so of Dabo's response. So again, like you can hear a little bit more context than some of the initial comments from Dabo that were being put out there on social media. Are we paying you eleven point five million dollars to go four and four? And it's not just this year; it's been it's been you know just the refusal to accept. All right, all right. What's this guy's name? Tyler. Hey, Tyler. I've, I've listened this to Tyler. enough of you, Tyler. Listen, uh, you can, you can have all your opinions that you want. All right. I don't know how old you are. Don't really care. All right. But let me tell you something. Uh, we won eleven games last year, and you're part of the problem. To be honest with you, because that is part of the problem. It's people like you that do that. All you do is ex- the appreciation. The expectation is greater than the appreciation. Mm. And that's the problem. And so, you know, we've won 12 10-plus win year, seasons in a row. That's happened three times in 150 years. So if you want to know why, Clemson ain't sniff a national championship for 35 years. We've won two in seven years. And there's only two other teams that can say that, Georgia and Alabama. Okay? Is this a bad year? Is this a – Yeah. And it's my responsibility. Take 100% responsibility for it. But all this bull crap you're thinking, all these narratives you read, listen, man, you can have your opinion all you want. And you can apply for the job. And good luck to you. All right? But to answer your question, all right, we're second in draft picks. We've graduated 98% of our guys. We're second in wins. All right. So there's, uh, there's Dabo. And, uh, you know, there's uh, quite a reaction to it (laughs) on social media and elsewhere. So what do you think about how he responded to this guy? I think he responded. (laughs) So the the, the way that this question was posed should not have been posed in the minute. I I think 
there is truth or validity to what the question at hand was. And I'll get to that here in a second. But I think Davo is completely justified in exactly uh, his response to this guy. Listen, uh, like he said, Clemson hadn't sniffed a national championship in 35 years. Davo has won two national championships. Um, I'll get into a little bit of the stats in, in, in our in our kind of upcoming question of a little bit of a breakdown in terms of, you know, their success compared to, you know, another team's success. But again, it's like you, you talk looking at draft picks, you start looking at number of wins, you start looking at national championships, win percentage, all of it. I mean, Clemson is up there. And I think his the number one, the important, the, the thing that he said that was most important is fans allow their – uh expectations to outweigh their appreciation at some point because at five years ago six years ago seven years ago this question never would have been asked because Dabo Sweeney was just a god at Clemson right that he couldn't do anything more he brought a program back and and introduced national championships to a fan base um and I I, I completely agree with what he said the appreciation has completely worn off and now suddenly you have one bad year after like 12 straight good years. And, you know, there, there's just no more appreciation. It's just all expectations um, at this point. And I think the last thing I would want to say here is I said, you know, I, if I were this fan, I would pose the question a little bit different. I think the way this question needed to be posed is why are you we paying you eleven and a half million dollars or whatever the figure is if you're not going to adjust to the coaching times or the current coaching landscape? That's the question that need to be pinned on Dabo Sweeney, not mm -hmm. not the other general question, because I do think Dabo Sweeney is doing a, a disservice to Clemson by getting them up to the point that he did and not continuing to play with the rules that college football is giving him. He's refusing right. to dabble in the NIL. He's refusing to dabble in the transfer portal. And that's what the game has evolved into. So why are we paying a coach eleven and a half million dollars if he doesn't want to play by the same rules? that everyone else is playing by. I think that's a fair question to well, pose to look, Dabo Sweeney. You know, Dabo, you know, again, like there at the end, he was like, okay, enough of this guy. He let him talk for two and a half minutes. Like just in the, you know, the, the clip that was posted, he let the guy talk for two and a half minutes and ramble on and kind of repeat some stuff and, you know, basically say, oh, I've been a fan my whole life. I deserve better than this. You know, it was kind of his, his whole, his whole point really. And Dabble, you know, he let him talk for two and a half minutes and finally said, okay, enough is enough. I'm going to get into this. I mean, just like with any other business, you get paid on, you know, what you have done up until that point. Like Major League Baseball, you know, the, the way they started doing their contracts with like phasing guys out but around the time they get to 30, they used to, but like guys used to get these big fat free agent contracts based on, you know, what they had done up into that point, their past experience and baseball kind of phased that out. But I mean, Dabo is getting paid on the fact that just what he talked about there, they went 12 consecutive years of winning double digit games that had been done once previously in Clemson history, back to back seasons. They did it four straight times from 87 to 90. That was the only previous time they had won double digit games in consecutive seasons he did it for 12 years in a row. And like, I never would have thought that I would be defending Dabo, but like when you lay it all out and, and just the way he did right there, 12 consecutive seasons of at least 10 wins, two national championships, all the draft picks that they've had, you know, they've, they've actually graduated guys at a pretty good rate. It's like, and the complete opposite of Pat Narduzzi, who we just, excuse me, talked about. He wore it himself. He fell on the sword. He said, it falls on me. We're having a bad season and it falls on me, but he's getting paid 11 and a half million bucks a year because of the previous 12 years that he had. And Clemson football had been nothing for 35 years prior to that, as he pointed out. So he deserves what he's getting right now. Now, as you said, he's got to, he's got to show that he's either willing to, you know, adapt or die Billy Bean style. Like he, he's, he's at a crossroads. I think where he is in his career now in terms of are you going to try to stick with these things that got you to that point or are you going to adapt to where college football is right now because that is what's holding him back right now he has not adapted these last couple of years yep so did Clemson ever have a dynasty 
And if so, is it over? Um, Clemson did have a dynasty. And when you – I'm specifically looking at that 12-year stretch that you just mentioned, 2011 – uh, to two, 2022, 10 wins every single season at minimum. Sometimes it was 15. I mean, they had a 15 and 0 season. Sometimes it was 14. Sometimes it was 12. Uh, it, w- regardless, for 12 years, they had between 10 and 15 wins. I did a quick average of the amount of wins between those seasons 11.8 wins they averaged per season for those 12 years. You look at Alabama and that same stretch, same 12 years, 12.6 wins. So we're talking 0.8, maybe a win difference compared to Alabama. And I would say Alabama was also a dynasty as well. You got two national championships in there. I mean, I don't know how else you can define a dynasty when they hit double-digit wins, they have two national championships, and when you're comparing them to the other dynasty-type team in that era, Alabama – Again, 11.8 wins per on average for Clemson, 12.6 for Alabama. You know, both teams won national championships. I think Alabama won a couple more. Can't remember the exact number. But I would say that Clemson was a mini dynasty and Alabama was the big dynasty. That like, If it wasn't those two, then it, there was probably like a 1% chance it was going to be someone else in those 12 years. At the very least, it's an ACC dynasty. And again, like when you look at – like. Alabama's got the true dynasty, but in terms of college football, Alabama, Clemson, you know, Ohio State can't even say they won multiple championships. And as Dabo said, Georgia, those are the, you know, Alabama, Georgia, Clemson are the only schools, you know, within the last 20 plus years to win the multiple national championships. So I I just, and, and within that, with that in that amount of time to do that for 12 straight years, nobody, you know, you just don't see teams doing that anymore. And you also don't see coaches last the way like Dabo has. And, you know, Saban is, is, is obviously the big one, but between Sabo and Dad, you know, the, the average length of, uh, of a tenure of an FBS college football coach is like three and a half years. And Dabo's going what 15, 16 years at this point. And so I agree. I agree that it is. Um, It's only over if Dabo doesn't make the changes. I think that they can still be a good program, but I don't think they'll be elite the way that they were unless he is, you know, willing and able to adjust. And I think that that's maybe where his administration might have to redirect him and remind him, hey, we are paying you all this money. (laughs) Use the appropriate resources. You got to get with the times now. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because I think he's falling back on what some coaches will fall back on. And it's like, well, I did it this way and we won this way. Well, the rules were different while you were doing it. At everyone that was point. playing by those rules. Now everyone's yeah. playing by a new set of rules. Except Every, that's right. Everyone else was playing by a different set of rules. And now they're playing by a new different set of rules. So real quick, college football playoff rankings uh, came out. Um, Brian and the guys over in the college football uh, channel are going to be talking about this in uh, just a little bit. Florida State is number four. Michigan is number three. Georgia is number two. And I think you said this, Jesse, Ohio State is number one. And I believe Josh called it also that Georgia was not going to be number one. So your reaction to this, Ohio State one, Georgia two, Michigan three, Florida State four. Uh, very happy to see it. It, it, it. To me, it seems as if uh, they have gone off of resume. Um, I, I would say that the only thing I would disclaim or, or have some qualm with is I think Florida State has been a little bit better than Michigan. But again, three and four, I'm not going to be too concerned. It seems like even though Florida State has a better strength of resume, that they were more impressed with how Michigan has beat crappy teams consistently. So It'll all figure its way out. Um, I, again, I'm just glad that it is a more resume-driven top four. What have you done this season, not what you've done the last four or five seasons? Right. I mean, Ohio State, because of the wins that they have against Notre Dame and Penn State, has the two most quality wins so far on their resume, even though they're probably not as good as some of the you know Ohio State teams of the past few years. For this year, 
I think they deserve that number one. And I agree. I think Florida State has a better resume than Michigan. I mean, everyone wants to talk about Michigan's consistency. Well, you've got some things that are, you know, kind of clouding <laughs> just, you know, exactly maybe why they were able to be so consistent in those games. And they still haven't played anybody. That's, right. that's what shocks me. You're about consistently beating bad teams on yeah. top of a scandal where there's potential you were sign stealing from very average teams. So. Yeah. It would be a shame if you weren't beating a lot of those teams consistently. Right. Like Clemson is still a better win for Florida State than anybody that Michigan has played. If you put Clemson on Michigan's schedule, I'm not sure that Michigan definitively wins that game. You know, and Florida State's got a win over Duke as well. I think Florida State has a has a better resume than Michigan has. You know, it's splitting hairs. They're all undefeated. Three versus four, and you know the the first ranking is never what the final one is when when they punch their tickets. It's just a good playoff. conversation starter. You get to yeah. see kind of in the minds of how they're thinking generally. Yep. All right. Well, that's going to do it for tonight. Appreciate you being here. And again, Brian and the guys over on the uh, the College Football Channel are going to have more of a breakdown of the uh, the initial college football playoff ranking. So that'll be coming up here in, I believe they're going to start at eight o'clock. So they'll be doing that. So uh, that's going to do it for me. Au revoir. I will, uh, I will talk to you next week, but Jesse and Vince are going to be here the rest of the week. Were you going to say something? Nope. All right. I'll be here the rest of the week, baby. All right. Hit that like button, subscribe, rate, and review. And we will talk to you later on IB Nation Sports Talk.